Welcome to my clinic on modeling the BNO West and O scale. I presented this clinic at a James River Division and MRA meet in November of 2019. The purpose of this clinic was to document how I model part of the BNO's West and O scale prior to the dismantling of my West End layout. This is Terry Turns, although due to recent surgery which has affected my ability to speak clearly and smoothly, I am using text-to-speech software to narrate this video. Let's get started. What are we going to discuss today? First, I'll give some background in how I came to model in 2 railo scale. Then, I'll speak to how I decided on the BNO and the West End in particular. We come upon the most important theme of this clinic. Can you accurately model a specific railroad, time, place and traffic patterns in 2 railo scale without scratch building everything? How I designed a track plan to fit my basement and the models to represent that prototype comes next. Finally, and sadly, is this the end of the line for my railroad? Like most people my age, I started my model railroading journey with a Lionel train set. While this set me up in the scale that I would do most of my modeling in, there would be twists and turns along the way. Lionel put out a book, which you can see in the image on the slide, which gave tips on how to make your Lionel trains look more realistic, and how to build a model railroad, not just a train layout. I found my copy at Madison Hardware. For those who did not get their start in 3Rail, Madison Hardware was something of a shrine in the Lionel community. Fortunately for me, it was within walking distance from where I grew up in Manhattan. This got me started on more realistic model railroading. By my teen years, I was reading Model Railroader, Model Railroad Craftsman, the occasional copy of O Gauge Trains, and hanging with HO modelers. The third rail and tubular track were annoying, but not enough to get me to jump to the smaller scale. By the early 1980s, Lionel had fallen on hard times. Lionel had been through several corporate owners, quality was poor, prototype fidelity was non-existent. The price of collectible, post-war Lionel was nearly equivalent to two rail O scale brass. With Lionel, apparently, not long for the world, I made the jump into O scale 2 rail. During my 3 rail days, I was all over the map with respect to the railroad I was modeling. If you know Lionel's habits of the period, they would come out with models lettered, it seemed, willy-nilly for various prototypes. My early attempts at repainting equipment were, to put it mildly, disastrous. So I modeled whatever railroad Lionel put out. But as I matured in the hobby, this would no longer do. And after the switch to 2 rail, it was decidedly unsatisfactory. The BNO caught my attention because it had a freight operation within my native NYC that was not too urban and not too rural. So, I planned on modeling the Staten Island Rapid Transit, the BNO subsidiary on Staten Island. Then, when Christmas, I asked for and received a copy of Robert's volume on the BNO's West End in Maryland and West Virginia. And that, as they say, changed everything. Any time that you are going to model the prototype, you know that compromises will have to be made. You just hope that the pluses outnumber the minuses. The BNO's West End stretched from Cumberland, Maryland to Grafton, West Virginia, and included BNO's crossing of the Allegheny Mountains. This was on the main stem of the BNO from the opening of the railroad until the route to Chicago was opened via Pittsburgh over Sand Patch Grade. This was big time mountain railroading for most of the line's existence. The area that the West End passes through is little changed from the days when the railroad pushed westward. It's surprising to think that an area, as near as 150 miles from the nation's capital, can be as undeveloped and as devoid of roads as the west end of the BNO. Because of this remoteness, the west end is infrequently modeled in any scale. But what makes the west end modelgenic? The west end has very little tangent, that is, straight, track and very steep grades. Both of these conditions are frequent occurrences on model railroads. In fact, during the construction of my model railroad, I added S-curves along two sides of the basement to more accurately simulate conditions on the west end. Most all of the west end is double-tracked, with triple-track in many locations. If you are an adherent of John Armstrong, the dean of track planning, double-tracking makes for a better model railroad, especially one for a small to medium space. It was nice of the prototype to be so accommodating. Another consequence of the remoteness and lack of development means that there are very few online industries on the West End, even the ubiquitous coal mines are, with only a couple of exceptions, off of the main line. This is both a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because a model railroad that accurately models the West End will have little or no switching. It's a blessing because industries, and the track work to reach them, do not have to be constructed. This will be a through route model railroad. Coal was, and is, king on the West End. Although for most of its heyday there was mixed freight and passenger trains aplenty. Because of the open top coal hoppers, traffic has to be strict loads east, empties west pattern.
and crossing the Allegheny Mountains, the B&O went up one side of the mountains, across the tableland, and down the other side to the Cheat River. From the Valley of the Cheat, the railroad went up the short, but equally steep Cheat River grade, tunneled under the second summit at Tunnelton, then made the final descent into Grafton. Trains needed to be helped in both directions out of MNK Junction at the Cheat River. Helper service would provide the operational theme of the model railroad, given the prototype slack of industries. That fixed the place on the west end. MNK Junction with the three-track Cranberry grade to the east, and the two-track Cheat River grade leading to the west. MNK Junction was a helper station with a four-track mainline coaling station, large steel water tank, sand house plus ash pits, an engine house, a large yard tower, etc., enough to keep a modeler busy. And speaking of helpers, in 1949 seven sets of eight BBAF-7 diesels took over helper duties at MNK Junction, leading to another happy anomaly for modelers. Steam is the road power and diesels as the helpers. However, the diesels were so successful that by March 1952, all steam was gone at MNK. That fixes our place and time. MNK Junction, 1949 to 1952, the steam to diesel transition. Now, let's talk about some of the things that went into the design. Although my basement only scaled out to be a medium space for the curvature I plan to use, based on the classes of steam that I would have to run, I wanted to avoid both a bowl of spaghetti track plan, as well as a double deck design. The former is considered poor form nowadays, while the latter, although reasonable given the layout's ambitions versus the space available, I did not want to deal with the construction complexities. Therefore, once through each scene, scenically sincere would be the rule. Helper service out of MNK up the two-track Cheat River and three-track Cranberry grades would be featured. The Morgantown and Kingwood branch line, which met the BNO main at MNK, would not be present. Not even by a dummy track. Because you cannot fake loads and empties with open-top hoppers, the design would have to be continuous operation. Loads east, empties west. The main line could not loop back on itself. For scenic features, the crossing of the Cheat River and the full four-arch trail run viaduct would be signature scenes. The eastern portal to the Kingwood Tunnel in Tunnelton would mark the westward end of the run. As the final design turned out, Trey Run could be represented two-thirds full-scale length, most impressive in O-scale. We've gone through how I developed the specific railroad, place and time, that I wanted to model. Could it be done in O-scale without having to scratch build everything? I'm here to dispel one of the major myths of O-scale. We've given ourselves the best chance by confining our ambitions to a tractable place and time. We've not undertaken, for instance, to accurately model the Pennsylvania Railroad between New York and Chicago from 1935 to 1965. On this slide is a copy of a page from Robert's book which shows the classes of B&O locomotives rated to run on the west end during the steam to diesel transition. You'll notice that only six classes of steam, and only one class of diesel, the DH1 class, in other words the F7. I have found zero photographic evidence that class KB1 was used on the west end, so, if it was used at all, it was not common. Class Q4 and Q4C Mikados have very few external differences, so for modeling purposes they can be treated as one class. That reduces it to four classes of steam, and one class of diesel in common use. What is not shown in this table, are the passenger classes used on the west end during this time period. On the next slide we'll show what's available, and fill in the missing passenger loco details. Here are all of the classes of locomotives used on the West End in the 1949-1952 timeframe. Notes to the table. Where two manufacturers are separated by a slash, it means that the model passed from one manufacturer importer to the next, usually with little to no change. Three rail models, which can be converted to two rail, are designated with an asterisk. USH equals US Hobbies, MG equals Max Gray, MTH equals Max Trainhouse. Let's begin with the freight locos in the first group. All of these locos have been available, with the exception of the EL5A, and usually by more than one manufacturer. Even the EL5A could be bashed from a USRA2-882, which was imported years ago. Amputating the trailing truck and changing other minor details might make an acceptable model. Your mileage may vary. The MTH model of the F7 is easily converted by dropping in MTH2 rail wheelsets, even the electronics are DCC compatible. The passenger power is shown in the next group of the slide. The P7 streamlined was used on the Cincinnati train for only a few years. It was imported by Weaver. The only major class of passenger loco omitted from the table is the class P1 Pacific. It was only omitted due to space constraints. No model of the BNO P1 in O scale has been imported, to this author's knowledge. In the final group in the table are some O scale locos that would not strain credibility to use on a West End layout. 
while not common on the west end, it's likely that some of these locos would be sent east or west at the head of a train, rather than as a light engine move. Under this rubric, I have both a P5 and a Q3 that I use on my layout. You'll notice that I use the past tense term, was, rather freely. Some of these manufacturers and porters are no longer in business, for example US Hobbies or Max Gray. However, it does not take much haunting of online forums, online auctions or O-scale swap meets to find these locos, often new and unused. Even the importers who are still in business, for instance Sunset or Oriental, imported these locos as limited runs. This is no different than the other scales. Again, the same search tactics will turn up these models, almost certainly on use. You can't have a coal hauling railroad without hoppers. On this slide, the diagram at the top illustrates the BNO hopper fleet by class in 1952. The bulleted list cites some of the classes that are readily available as O-scale models. N12, USR8 twin. 22% of the BNO hopper fleet. N35. N37. And N41 offset side twins. 35% of the hopper fleet. W2. Offset side quads. 15% of the hopper fleet. W7. Offset side triples. 9% of the hopper fleet. The total, easily accessible in O scale, is 81% of the 1952 hopper fleet. On the next slide, we'll see who makes these model hoppers. This slide illustrates the manufacturers who make hoppers suitable for the BNO's 1952 fleet. Notes to the table. Where two manufacturers are separated by a slash, it means that the model passed from one manufacturer importer to the next, usually with little to no change. Three rail models, which can be converted to two rail, are designated with an asterisk. USH equals US Hobbies, MG equals Max Gray, PSC equals Precision Scale Company. As you can see, all of the classes of BNO hoppers are available from many manufacturers in kit or built up form. Many are three rail conversions. This is a good place to turn aside and talk about three rail conversions. For more than the last two decades, the three rail market has demanded scale sized and scale detailed models. Some manufacturers have dedicated scale lines, like MTH's Premier line. Others differentiate by labeling their older, toy-like lines, traditional, or conventional. Many of the three rail hoppers are diecast, following in the footsteps of Lionel's diecast, pre-war, offset quad. Do not scoff at modern diecast, it can be exquisitely detailed. For instance, my diecast Lionel N35 twin hoppers are better than any brass models that I have, with details like see-through brake platforms. In fact, I prefer mine to brass since I do not have to treat them gingerly. The photo on this slide shows 2K line offset quads that I converted. The process is simple. Two rail wheel sets are used in the three rail trucks. The three rail couplers are cut off with a Dremel. Two rail KD couplers bolt onto pre-drilled holes. K line even provided the screws and coupler shins with the three rail car. The car on the left is as converted. The car on the right has been converted and weathered. The weathered car will not win any contests but it certainly passes the three-foot test. Whether diecast, plastic, or brass, BNO hoppers are readily available in O scale. As was said in the slide for locomotives, some of these manufacturers are out of business. However, the same search techniques will turn up the models that you need. Even better, since models like the Weaver cars were mass-produced. You cannot model a railroad accurately without representing their signature rolling stock. During the steam and transition eras, and before the rise of the mass car builders, many railroads built their own freight cars, either as experiments or as entire fleets. Prime among signature rolling stock were cabooses. Most railroads sported their own caboose designs, and these cars stayed with their railroads a long time. Here, again, the West End comes to a rescue as only two caboose types were rated for the helper division, the I-12 wagon top and the I-5 steel underframe, specifically the I-5D with a weighted underframe and LinkedIn wheelbase. In the I-12 caboose, O-scale has an abundance of riches. The I-12 has been produced many many times by a number of importers. Most recently, it has been produced by Lionel in plastic. The photo on this slide shows a Sunset Brass Import I-12, left, and a Lionel I-12, right. The Lionel has some easily corrected out of scale elements, like the stack. But otherwise it's dimensionally and detail correct, an excellent model. The most annoying thing about the Lionel I-12 is that, like some three-rail rolling stock, it sits high to accommodate the oversized three-rail flanges. This can be largely remedied during the conversion process. Other signature rolling stock is similarly available. During the steam and transition years, the BNO Boxcar fleet was dominated by class M26 and M27 cars, variations of the PRRX23 car. This too has been widely produced. The most recent, the Plastic Atlas car, has been produced in several BNO paint schemes with accurate numbering. 
Unique to the BNO was the N53 Wagontop Boxker. This has been produced in brass many times, but the plastic car produced first by Weaver and now by Atlas is the best of the bunch. Several decorations are available, including express car variants. The M55 Boxker was quite common on the prototype and also in O scale. Another unique BNO car was the N34 Wagontop Covered Hopper. Various brass versions have been imported. On the passenger side, all BNO unique passenger consists have been produced, along with BNO decorated heavyweight cars. The Cincinnati train, a unique transit which plied the West End for about four years, also exists in O scale. Do not be deterred by some of these cars being only available as brass imports. Brass has long since ceased to be treated as object art, and the guys who thought that they would fund their retirement by selling their brass collection are selling at fire sale prices. With all of the elements that we need to know in place, we can discuss designing the track plan. Of course, when I actually designed the plan, I had to take educated guesses at what some of the design parameters would be. I wanted a minimum mainline radius of 62 inches, 2 inches more than the manufacturer's stated minimum for the EM1-2-884 model. I did my track planning in third planet, and during construction, all dimensions were accurate to less than an inch. The diagram on this slide shows the track plan that I settled on. The outline of the basement and the major obstructions are in red. Water heater and well pressure tank in the lower left. The inverted L shape are the basement stairs. The rectangle is an HVAC unit, and the small circles are lowly columns. MNK Junction Helper Station is at the bottom, with the two-track Cheat River grade, left, and the three-track Cranberry grade, right. No, the track indicated in MNK Junction is not how it was built, adjustments were made during construction. Elsewhere the mainline track plan was pretty much adhered to. The crossing of the Cheat River takes place opposite the bottom of the stairs, which makes this signature scene the first thing one sees on entering the train room. Continuing up the Cheat River grade, the tracks pass through the site of the town of Rollsburg, West Virginia. Further along, as the track passes the Lolly Column, that six-foot straightaway is the site of the Trail Run Viaduct, where scenery will extend almost to the floor. After Trail Run, and with lots of selective compression, the tracks turn towards Tunnelton, West Virginia and the Kingwood Tunnel. The eastern portal of the Kingwood Tunnel is located near where the tracks pass another Lolly Column. This marks the end of the run westbound. Helpers would cut off the train, and return to MNK, Junction. Out of MNK, eastbound, to the right, the train begins climbing the three-track Cranberry Grade. The tracks are, inside to outside, downhill track, fast uphill track, slow uphill track. The tracks continue around more than two sides of the basement, until they enter the central blob, which represents the top of Cranberry Grade at Terre Alta, West Virginia. Helpers cut off and return downgrade to MNK Junction. And speaking of the central blob, you cannot see it from the third planet drawing, but it's a two-track, two-turn helix. It functions as serial train storage. Westbound trains enter the lower level of the helix through the eastern portal of the Kingwood Tunnel. They then proceed up through the helix in turn, to emerge at Terra Alta as westbounds. Eastbound trains enter the upper level of the helix at Terra Alta, proceed in turn down through the helix, to emerge at the Kingwood Tunnel as eastbounds. In this way westbound empty hoppers stay headed west and eastbound loads re-emerge heading east. The helix can hold at least two trains in each direction. By the way, on the prototype helpers, even steam helpers, would push in either direction, even facing backwards, because there were no turning facilities at MNK. I've duplicated that operation on the model. It's shocking at first to some of the operators, but it works. The grades on Cheat and Cranberry are 2%, stiffening to 2.75% at the last curve into Terra Alta. That's somewhat less than on the prototype. The prototype could only haul 2 to 2 and a half loaded cars per powered axle. I've found that the model is the same. You can't beat physics. When we moved to Virginia in 2006, I swore this time would be different, and I would not let anything stop me from building in the basement. Therefore, I bought two garden sheds to hold all of the junk that normally accumulates. The unfinished basement had to be prepared, walls and floors painted. The first section of the open grid benchwork was up by July 2007. The 3x7-foot sections were designed to bolt together. It was not designed to be modular or even sectional, as track was laid continuously between sections but it would facilitate disassembly in the event of a move. The layout is predominantly Atlas flex track, although every brand of O-scale flex and sectional track was used, even some legacy products. Roadbed is two-layer, cork over camper tape. After two or three sections were up and some track was laid, I bought an MRC Command 2000 system to check out DCC operation. I decided that I liked this DCC stuff, and thereafter I installed a lens system, and I now operate with JMRI tied to the lens system. Backdrops went up in 2014, and the mainline was completed in 2015. Why so slow? 
I did not retire until midway through 2016. Is this the end of the line? I've developed some health problems that require me to move into a single level home. So far, we have not found a replacement home with a suitable basement. Given how the layout was tightly designed around a theme, it would be very difficult to modify, basically compress, the track plan. What is in the future? Another basement home for MNK. A custom built out building. Or abandonment and building another layout. After decades researching, dreaming, designing and building this version of the West End, I'm reluctant to give up on it. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you have any more questions about my layout, the West End, or O-Scale in general, please ask them via the comments. I'll be sure to answer.